But to come back to the second point of what you were saying about that, um, that dropping into your body that you're talking about, I think if you look at the biggest wound, not the biggest wound, I think all wounds that we experience in relationships. So our trauma plays out in our relationship, right? It's, yes. Trauma is about how I relate to myself and how I relate to the people around me. Yes. Um, and so healing happens in relationship to myself and how I relate to the people around me. And so that wounding happens when, when I am just a big ball of energy and emotion in those initial years. If I don't have the presence of a loving, nurturing adult to see me in my uh, in all of my my emotions that I experience when I'm happy, sad, lonely, jealous, rageful, the only perhaps the only relationship throughout my whole life where love should be completely unconditional and I should have loving eyes mirrored back at me is from my parent as yeah. a child. Yeah. So that I learn that I am I am lovable in every single one of my emotions mm. and that I'm free to express them and still be loved. Most of us don't experience that. And so there's, the, there's a disconnect there and the core wound if you trace everything back is, I'm not lovable. Yes, yeah. So my dad was an alcoholic, right? You can talk about um, losing myself in that, feeling very scared, all of it. You can trace it all back to, was I not enough? Yeah. Am I not lovable? Yeah. yeah? The relationship that I then went on to have with my mum, the way that I saw her sadness and I felt a sense of responsibility to make her feel okay as a result of what she was experiencing. Trace that back, what does it mean? It, Am I lovable when I'm not trying to make sure that your emotions yeah, are okay? Yeah. So all traces back to the same thing. And so what breathwork helps us do is to drop back into our bodies and to start to express that emotion. And 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 one of the things that uh, I talk about regularly with the inner child work that you're talking about is, is that we go and revisit it and we show you actually you are enough. Yeah. You know, when you are sad, when you are lonely, when you're jealous, when you're rageful, when you're all of those things, you're lovable then. Because a lot of self-help work if we're not careful personal development work is trying to find another new way do this so that you can feel really good about yourself and then you'll have a sense of pride you'll have a sense of being enough yeah right? yeah but, but actually the true work is uh can i love myself when i've just really messed up again mm. how do i how do i love myself back then mm. how do i hold space for myself not when i've just achieved when i've just released a book or done a great session right when i've really messed up and, I, and I'm looking at myself and thinking, how have I done this again? How did I get here? Can I love myself enough then mm. to hold myself back to uh, where I want to be in my life? And that's the, like the real work, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's that sense of self-love is something that should have been installed in us when we were children and most of us don't get it. It's so true. And, uh, you know, I was talking about the being alone in, in a field. Mm-hmm. And the way I kind of, and again, this was all in deep work, so it wasn't just me sitting there thinking it. Um, the way I came to uh, peace with the aloneness was that I wasn't alone. I was in the field, mm. so I was surrounded by nature. And it took me back to a memory where I used to collect caterpillars because I, I, I've said this on this podcast before, but where I was thinking, well, if I put that in a jar, it's going to turn into a butterfly. So I'll just wait for it, you know, thinking it would happen that moment. And so they're the things that I used to love. And my nan, who died when I was seven, we would have, you know, mud pies together and all those kind of things. So actually, I realized that the field wasn't a place of aloneness. It was a place of connection. Mm. And all I had to do was flip that narrative, not in a way that discarded the real experience of abuse and neglect and all of those things, but in a way that meant that if you can just sometimes change your perception of yourself, Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you look at the seasons and you look at the way that nature works, and I think that's a good place to always go back to, to understand that you're never really alone. It's just how you view it. And that's not to change that experience. It's to move through that. It's what you were saying before with not discarding friends and actually just moving through that experience and realizing what it's all about. I think our perception of ourselves can be so fixed that sometimes just understanding that, it's the zooming out thing. I love that when you say zoom out, if you zoom out a little bit more, are you alone or are you surrounded by the insects and the birds and the, yeah, yeah. the badges? And, you know, that's my sort of Mary Poppins view of the world, I guess. But that's how I was able to come to terms with that. And it makes perfect sense, right? If you if you bring it back to what we were just saying about how trauma is, how we experience ourselves and how we experience um, our relationship with others. Right? Yeah. If we're able to, um, we get that sense in those initial years, we get that sense from our parents, right? 
Yeah. And so if for whatever reason, their own trauma stuff was going on for them, whatever, for whatever reason, they weren't able to show up for us. Mm -hmm. So we were given that slanted view of ourselves through the, through the loving gaze of what they were able to show us. Yeah. My dad was an alcoholic. My mum was caught up in the turmoil of my dad's alcoholism. So, so was unable to be emotionally present for me in the way that I needed. Mm -hmm. So the work is to, to, to go back to validate that to, I don't even necessarily need to make full rational sense of that. I can let can start to complete the cycle through somatic practices that help me. In my case, I love breath work, but there's a million and one different one, different somatic practices, but all involved being in the body Yeah. To, 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 to allow that cycle to complete. Yeah. And then I can start to do what you're talking about, right? Mm. Which is zoom out that little bit further. And then how do I start to look at my experience as a child in a different way mm. and actually start to see, oh, hang on a minute. What I experienced wasn't a reflection of who I was. Yes. Because what, and you'll probably find this yourself, what you find with most inner child experiences, the first time I ever had a deep um, moment with my inner child internally, I sort of, uh, I can't visualize things very well in my head, but I had a knowing that this was happening, right? Which would make sense if you've experienced it in the way that I do. But I remember like having this moment with my inner child for the first time and I was like waiting for it, for him to tell me all these things that he needed, right? Like to like say, this is what happened and this is why I need you. And in this moment, he like just showed me a flower. And you're like, in that second, you're like, your rational brain wants to go, what's this about? But then you go, oh, he always had moments. Yeah, Like he was always connected to the world. Yeah, yeah. Like there was a sense of freedom. Yeah. But the big things that I experienced on such a deep level have overshadowed all of that. Yeah. And I've I I had this then belief that my whole childhood was like one of sadness and uh wanting to run away. But actually what you realize is that when you go right back to being a child, it's all about the moment. Yeah. Yes, the present moment. Yeah, it's yeah. all about the present moment, which yeah. is why um children, if you look at like young kids, most of them, generally speaking, even if they get obsessed with devices in their early age, they don't take photos. No, you're right. Yeah. They don't because they don't, they're not, they're in the moment. Yeah. I don't need this moment tomorrow. I just need this moment now. Now, yeah. And so um, then you just, you start to realize actually life, life is about moments. And as a child, I had moments and there was always that connection there, but, but I lost sight of it. Do you know what was so powerful about what you've just said is I did a session with a lady the other day and we were talking about her father who very narcissistic and, you know, um, it was because you said you don't really need to understand every every reason behind why your parents do what they do. Now, one of the things that I did, because I was left with very little choice, is when my dad got out of prison, he moved back into the home. And my only way with coping with that was to be curious about how I could understand him so I could live there and survive it. And also be curious about my mum's decisions. But what happens is when you're curious at the age of, you know, in your teen years is that you haven't got the full prefrontal development yet. So again, you're doing it from a immature place. And so I, but I was understanding it and I was like, right, okay, I can understand that he did this for this reason. He's remorseful. She's doing that because of this reason. She's just trying to survive and all self-abandonment because none of it was about being safe. Mm. And some of what you've said there is really important because it takes you out of being present. It takes you into discovering their lives. It actually did probably help for me to have a relationship with them for the next 20 years, um, which didn't help me at all. But it, at the time, I thought it was a really useful thing to do. And a lot of people around me at the time were like, I don't understand how you could have a relationship with dad. I don't understand how you... So, of course, you're getting told left, right and centre, this is crazy. No one means to do that to you, but you're kind of being gaslighted by everyone around mm. you, like you're crazy, there's something wrong with you. But equally, if I don't do this and understand them, then I'm kicked out of this family, which mm. is my reality now, which is fine, by the way, because I've come to terms with that. But it's one of those things where I and this is where I'm getting to with this long drawn out explanation, but I realized that by understanding their motives, I ended up carrying a baby, if you use the baby as the metaphor, which was their trauma. Mm -hmm. So now I've got my mum's baby and my dad's baby and I'm carrying their babies for them and, and, and not actually looking after my own and walking through life carrying these crying, screaming babies while they're free of it mm. because I'm carrying it for them, right? 
and I'm carrying it for the family actually because if I can carry this load then everybody else is okay and you know everyone else can pretend that nothing bad's happened here and everyone around us the structure that the community that stuck by him so I'm carrying these babies and then I finally came to the realize it, it took me till I was 37 to think oh my god mm. I'm carrying these crying screaming babies for everybody else whilst I am screaming and di- literally dying dying the rage everything even though I seemingly looked fine this isn't that long ago mm. you know maybe nine years ago I'm dying and and everything I am is dying around me and I sort of used that as a metaphor for this this girl I said the th- the final thing you need to do is put the baby down yeah and she said to me do you think that's why I've never wanted my own child and I said I can't answer that for you but if you're carrying somebody else's baby what time have you got to mm. create a safe loving family yeah and that's why and I'm saying that because one of the questions I get asked the most is have you forgiven your dad and I always go yep yep I have and I have to come back out of that and go however there's a cost to this do not think that forgiveness is the path to healing because it's not Mm. because you end up especially if you're too young to understand of this you end up abandoning yourself in the process yeah 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 and like I don't even think you have to forgive no, and I've seen you say this, hence the reason I brought this bit up, actually. Yeah, because like, I believe that like um, moving on and forgiveness are slightly different. And I think a lot of people get them confused. So a lot of people will say, look, forgiveness is not about you. It's about freeing. It's, it's not about them. It's about freeing yourself from yeah. the pain that they caused. I've said that myself, to be fair. But that's moving on. Yeah. Forgiveness requires a little bit of grace. Yeah. Um, so in every case, you don't necessarily need that. No. Now, it could be a way... Like, and, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of people get, you know, uh, incredible freedom from forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So it's not that, um, it's not that you, that you shouldn't do it. It's just that you don't, you don't have to. It's a lesson. It's that conformity thing. And it comes from religious texts. Yeah. Um, I'm not religious, by the way. I am very respectful of um, nature and I guess that's a religion in itself. But uh, when I realized, oh, Perhaps I've, and again, it was people around me, you know, your dad's really sorry for what he's done and your mum's trying really hard. And my mum used to tell me all the time I could put you into care. You know, there was always that kind of, you're the problem sort of thing. So my way of being the good girl and the pleaser is to understand and then regulate my own emotions because I've got this understanding, which I I, I didn't understand really. Yeah. Um, But I thought I did. And mm. and you're right. That comes from that cultural thing of forgiveness. Is you know don't don't steal, don't lie, forgive others, all those sorts of things. And I think it's not always safe to go down that road with people. And I think when it's been abuse, like sometimes people get a little bit obsessed with the forgiveness thing. And my my, you know, my thought process is always, why don't you put the energy that you put into forgiveness when it comes to abuse? that energy that you have for pushing people to forgive, why don't you put that into pushing people to take accountability? Absolutely. Because then you're, you're, you know, your you're, you're, you're seeming need for people to find forgiveness yeah. will come a lot easier yeah. if you push the abuser to, to take accountability. Yeah. And I think in most cases, we have a subconscious knowing that abusers will never take accountability. Because they're so, narcissistic a lot exactly. of the time. And so we want the discomfort that comes with that to go away and so the next thing to do is to go on to the abused and get them to push for forgiveness yeah. which is essentially so we can push it all back under the carpet again yes it's exactly and, and everybody that. gets to live comfortably it's exactly that yeah, but yeah. no one's living comfortably because everybody knows exactly uh, you can't deny and even though children are very good at denying their own feelings because they're led by the adults around them as an adult you cannot deny that if your husband has sexually abused your daughter there's a problem. (laughs) You you can pretend as much as you want. And it's the same with, you know, addictions and stuff like that. I get it. Like people are escaping pain, but the abuse that comes along with that or the neglect that comes along, is not okay. Mm. Like there has to be someone somewhere that goes, this isn't okay for that child. Yeah. And I think your book really, um, I read that very, very quickly, by the way, as well. It's nice to hear, man. I still get a little bit like... Uh, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah, it's weird, yeah. But yeah. It, it's one of those books where, like I said, you you can put it down and then, you know, some books you put it down, you're like, oh, this is quite a difficult read. 
And I'd say that about mine, actually, it is quite a difficult read looking back on it, but I'll do another one, which will be easier. Um, but th that felt like it wasn't. It felt like I could put it down and if I was distracted, I could go back to it, pick it up again. And it wasn't like, oh, no, I need to go back 10 pages. It, it's Again, you articulate things beautifully. You simplify things that shouldn't be that simple, but you make it simple and you make it easy to digest. So anyone that follows your content will will get the same vibe from your book. Oh, that's good to hear, man. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's hard when you're doing it because I think there's so much pressure being an author. I mean, I self-published, so I had a whole different experience. It was like, oh, well, if no one buys it, which thankfully they did. Thank God, because it was a lot of work. It was before AI as well, so I had no way of cheating. Not that I'm saying you did, of course. <laughs> but what I'm saying is it, I did a lot of that. Yeah, it, it took me two years because I'm not, I am creative, but I'm not, I keep saying it to you how articulate and how you make it so digestible. I, I haven't got that skill set, but it, it reached the people it needed to reach. This is, and I'm not just saying this, it is a book that you could probably read in a day or two and feel like I've got so much out of that. And oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, it's, it's important that people know that because there's a lot of, there's a lot of self-help books out there, mm. but what you've done particularly talking about toxic parents is you're reaching like you say not many people of our age and you think about this generational traumas let's just look at world war one world war two the sort of rationing and, and and also how diverse we are as a country now um, a lot of our ancestors will be from outside of this country which means there's other traumas and things and mm. strengths that are being brought into the mix so when we look at the way we are, I mean, I always meet a lot of cycle breakers because if evolutionary neuroscience is right and there's seven generations worth of genetic expression in our bodies, perhaps even more, that's like 600 years worth of shit. Mm. Someone's got to break the cycle. And I do think it's happening now mm. more and more. You mentioned, and this is why I'm saying this, you mentioned the Middle Eastern philosophies briefly there when you were talking about capitalism and so on. And I'm interested in talking about that because... It's, as you say, now it's sort of been brought to our attention more. We were talking a little bit off camera about yin yang and, and protons and all sorts of fancy stuff. But it, it does occur to me that it is being brought into us more now. But it's at the time when there's a lot of people wanting to find something. Mm. Now, it's always been there. I mean, th those Eastern philosophies are flipping tremendous. And I mean, I sometimes think, how did they work it all out? Um, but again, it goes back to the body. Yeah. So what's your take on that? I think when you slow down and you're in touch with your body, I think that um, we know at our core what we want and need in almost every case. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Eastern philosophies have known that for, for a long time. Slow down, listen to your body and you'll get the answer. I think the problem that you have in what has become a very, and I'm not against capitalism, by the way, but, but hyper-capitalism as it is, which is like, money and power over everything we have now have a society that's built around uh, the need to make people think that they don't have what they need. Like even the mental, the mental health conversation, like I, I put it in sort of, you know, speech bubbles like that. It's because look at that over the last six, seven years. And what you'll see is, yeah, capitalism's got its hands on it. And so yeah. now it's like, we need to tell everybody, we need to go, everyone has mental health, You, which is essentially saying you all have a problem and you all don't have what you need. Mm. And so you need to go out and buy or invest in something to be able to do that. Yeah. When, when, when the truth is like, well-being is not an individualistic ideal, mm. right? When, when, when I am connected with, like we've talked a lot about this, when my body is around people that make me feel safe, when my life is aligned with my purpose in that I am spending most of my time doing the things that, feel fulfilling to me then i have a sense of um well-being yeah i feel aligned i feel okay i feel in flow mm. the moment something in my life uh within the my communities and within the context of my experience goes off key or mm -hmm. out of kilter i will start to feel it in my body yeah that's not failing mental health that's not a mental health struggle mm. That's my body doing exactly what it's supposed to do mm. to try and motivate me to create change. Mm. And I think that's, 
what I try and portray in my work, which is like always zoom out. I say to people, maybe, maybe the way that you feel makes perfect sense when viewed in the full context of your experience. Yes. And with you saying that, talking about full context and we'll go back to the eastern did i say middle eastern i didn't mean to say middle eastern if i, I know did. what you meant i think you did but i know what you meant <laughs> i don't know why i said that although there's some great philosophies out there <laughs> yeah, too everywhere yeah